It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Molly Ford. She's a distinguished physician with Vanderbilt Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee, and she's also a very busy mother of two boys, age four and five. And besides that, she still manages to seem to be a rock star in helping us um, get Celesta going and off the ground. Now, Dr. Ford earned her medical degree from Oregon Health and Science University, where she completed her residency in general surgery. F furthering her experience and expertise, she pursued a fellowship in colon and rectal surgery at Oshner Clinic. Dr. Ford began utilizing Celeste in 2013 during her fellowship and has since performed over 50 cases, showcasing her extensive expert experience and commitment to advancing patient care in the treatment of fecal incontinence. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Molly Ford. Thank you, Simone. Um, so I, I definitely have some informative, hopefully helpful slides to cover, and then I, I want to leave enough time at the end to really um, keep it open for questions. I, I think the, the best way to insert a question is through the chat and then they'll be read at the end. Um, so please feel free. Um, you know, I know it's a little bit harder on a webinar to be interactive, but um, feel free to jot down any questions that you have and I'd be happy to try to address them at the end. So what we're going to cover tonight, what is bowel or fecal incontinence? How do you diagnose it? Um, what is my tre treatment care pathway? What is a, a possible treatment care pathway? Um, more about Celesta uh, as an option in this treatment care pathway. Who might be candidates for treatment? And then next steps, um, patient follow-up, um, and, and then training as, as a provider for yourselves. So um, as a colorectal surgeon, um, you know, I, I operate on the diseases of the colon, the rectum, and the anus. And so um, this is a very familiar area for me, but I also understand that for um, folks coming in with training in maybe different areas, um, that, that it's not as familiar. So I wanted to just start by going through some of the basics of anatomy. Um, so the rectum is obviously a continuation of the colon. Um, it's lined in uh, columnar cells and uh, about halfway down in the anal canal, this lining continues. So the upper half of the anal canal is, is lined with columnar cells, again, similar to the colon and the rectum. The lower half of the anus, um, closer to the outside, is lined with the same type of cells as skin, so squamous. And so this point of differentiation, and it's a little bit um, skewed in this diagram, but, but this point of differentiation, the white line um, between the pink and the darker uh, kind of brown red is called the dentate line. And that marks this transition in cells. Um, and important for Celesta and for other um, anorectal procedures, this, this also um, is a transition in innervation. And so the, the distal aspect of the anal canal um, that's lined with the squamous, muco uh, squamous mucosa, squamous lining, um, has similar innervation to our skin, where if you pinch it, you poke it, you cut it, it's going to hurt. Um, but above this, proximal to this, um, the lining it, uh, is such that um, it feels pain similar to the colon and the rectum and the small bowel where um, it's truly just a distension type pain. And so if you cut it in a, or poke it or um, pinch it in an awake person, they're not going to feel it. And that's why for internal hemorrhoids, we can do things like rubber band ligation uh, in the office. And that's why for a Celesta, we can do an injection in the office without any sedation or anesthetic. Um, so I wanted to go over um, fecal incontinence. And and typically in our practice, we call it fecal incontinence, but sometimes the word fecal is unfamiliar to patients. And so a lot of the literature and, and, and many refer to it as bowel incontinence. Um, and it's an in, in, inability to control bowel movements. Um, and so patients may can complain of things like, you know, they're in the grocery store and stool sneaks out without them knowing it. They may complain that um, they are, they thought they were passing gas, but they end up passing stool. They may complain that they have urgency and they can't get to the bathroom fast enough unless they're literally sitting, you know, at home right next to their bathroom. Um, or some patients will have difficulty holding in gas and, and, um, it, it sounds like some have had some improvement in that with Celesta, um, or just difficulty staying clean. Sometimes they'll call it smearing, um, a lot of different terms for it, but, um, but it falls under the same treatment pathway. 
a lot of people have this, and I, I truly believe that this is a, a gross underestimate, but um, a study specifically looking at it estimated 8% of U.S. adults have fecal incontinence or bowel incontinence, and it's much more common uh, in women who have stress urinary incontinence. So over 58% of patients that have this also have fecal incontinence. So again, if this is, if stress urinary incontinence is a disease you treat, um, it's it's great to ask the question, do you also have fecal incontinence? Do you also leak stool? Um, or, or really on any intake, we're adding to any sort of uh, review system form. Um, because again, it's 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 out there, and as our population ages, uh, you can see in this bottom graph that uh, as everyone ages, their incontinence rate uh, increases, and you know that's probably for a few different reasons. But the primary reason is that the insult um, was when they were younger, so generally, you know, obstetric trauma, whether it be just carrying a child and the effects of of you know, a large gravid uterus on the pudendal nerves um, and some some nerve, some degree of nerve damage um, and pelvic floor um, weakening or the actual, you know, act of, of delivery and, and muscle damage. And so, um, so uh, initially when patients are young, they have enough muscle bulk that they can compensate for this uh, defect, uh, this deficit. And then as we age and all the muscles in our body atrophy, same thing happens to the anal sphincter. And then you see this um, trend again where, where continence or control um, decreases. And so most of the patients that I see are over 60. Uh, most of them are over 65, um, but occasionally I'll see younger patients as well. Um, the, the biggest thing that I think that's hard, and this is something that I've learned just uh, with 11 years in practice, is we want more patients to come seek, seek treatment for fecal incontinence, but it's just a really hard thing to, um, to increase your numbers for. And, and I think as we increase infor information and knowledge surrounding incontinence, I think this will all improve, but it's just a slow process because it's embarrassing and patients don't want to talk about it. Often they're too embarrassed to bring it up um, or, you know, they, they feel like they can manage it on their own. They'll just, you know, invest in their incontinence pads and um, and just kind of live with it. Um, and the most heartbreaking of it all, though, is that many patients come to my clinic and they've actually mentioned it to one of their other physicians, typically their primary care provider, who unknowingly has kind of shut them down because they weren't aware that there were newer treatments for incontinence. And so then the patient feels like, okay, well, I told my doctor about it and nothing uh, came of that. And they said that there's no treatment and they obviously believe that. And so expanding the information, expanding knowledge about it is really important. Um, but again, it's just a topic that most people don't want to talk about because it's socially not all that acceptable to talk about stool and incontinence for whatever reason. Um, so one uh, tool that can be used, again, you know, I think the most basic thing to do, and this has worked well in our clinic, is just add it to your review of systems and just have every every patient that comes through your clinic door answer the question, do you have leakage of stool or fecal incontinence, bowel incontinence, whatever you want to call it, whatever makes the most sense to patients within your system, um, you know, yes or no. And if the answer is yes, ask them if they want it addressed, ask them if they want to talk more about it. And maybe they don't, but the first step is obviously identifying who has it. Um, there are many different ways to kind of score the severity of it. And the Cleveland Clinic Fecal Incontinence Score is one that's been um, validated. It's been used in a lot of the different studies that have been done. And again, if this is something you wanna use in your own practice, it's helpful because you can kind of help the patient to get a numeric score um, on kind of their impact on quality of life before any sort of intervention. And then they can do it again after an, any sort of intervention, which kind of, again, gives more of a tangible assessment of whether it works or not. Um, I found that patients know if they have poor uh, quality of life from their fecal incontinence, and then they know if they have improvement. So um, I, I don't as rigorously stick to the, um, to the scale, but it is a really nice tool if, if you want to use it. Um, and so again, uh, the biggest thing, again, it's not cancer that we're curing by improving incontinence, it's quality of life. And it's a really big impact to help someone's fecal incontinence, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, it can really negatively impact 
quality of life, limit activities, impact your relationships. Um, this is a, a study that was done on quality of life scores, and you can see that the blue bar is for incontinence patients, uh, fecal incontinence patients. The, the gray bar is for patients not affected by incontinence, and the higher score is the better quality of life and significantly uh, decreased scores in all patients with fecal incontinence. Um, and so, you know, I have a lot of patients who come and they haven't been to church in years because they don't think they can sit through the whole service without having an incontinence episode, being embarrassed about the smell. Um, they don't leave the house very often. They don't go to lunch with their friends because, you know, eating typically uh, produces a, a, a some movement within the intestinal tract. And so um, a higher chance of, of needing to have a bowel movement and, and not being able to control it. And so um, they really limit what they do. Um, so uh, the pathway, um, uh, the options range. And so um, often it truly does take multiple um, modalities, multiple approaches to figure out what the, uh, to figure out how to optimize a patient. And so it's not usually just one thing. Um, it's usually uh, starting with the conservative therapy. So change the diet, increase the fiber, um, you know, avoid, um, you know, foods that tend to, tend to, increase intestinal transit time. Um, medications like Imodium um, are really helpful uh, in patients who don't struggle with constipation as well. So low-dose Imodium can slow down intestinal transit, increase the amount of water that's absorbed within the colon. Um, we all know that liquid stool is going to be um, easier to, uh, to leak out than solid stool. So by eliminating that liquid component, then you're decreasing their chance of incontinence. Imodium also has uh, some impact on the anal sphincter itself. So it increases sphincter tone. Um, and so that can also help. Um, fiber supplements, like specifically Metamucil or Citrusel, um, those are the better bulking agents. And so those, um, again, tend to help decrease the, the liquid component to stool. Um, pelvic floor strengthening exercises, also a, a good conservative therapy to consider. Um, often we'll hand a paper to the patient explaining some of the pelvic floor strengthening exercises, you know, Kegel type exercises. Um, and sometimes uh, if a patient's real motivated, we'll refer them to pelvic floor physical therapy as well. I personally haven't found as much improvement in incontinence to stool um, with pelvic floor physical therapy as things like urinary incontinence or um, difficulty with defecation, kind of defecatory retraining. Um, I think those are probably better um, pelvic floor uh, physical therapy um, referrals. Um, and so if, if they don't get to the point where they feel like their quality of life has significantly improved, if they don't get to a point where they feel like, you know, they can do the things that they want to do, um, then the next uh, very reasonable step to consider is Celesta. And there are a lot of benefits to Celesta, which we're going to talk about in a minute, but um, it's a minimally invasive treatment. Uh, it is a bulking agent, and we'll talk about the, the mechanism. Um, but that's, that's a really nice next step to consider. And then um, if a patient, um, for whatever reason, either isn't a candidate or if they have terrible incontinence and they're leaking, you know, all the time, or if they have diarrhea that isn't getting better with uh, medications, then then maybe they're more important, appropriate for a first-line therapy um, that is surgical. And sacral neuro neuromodulation, sacral nerve stimulator um, is what we use as first-line. Correction of anatomical pathologies has really fallen out of favor. Um, it makes, you know, intuitive sense that if you fix the muscle and it because it has a defect, um, that your continence should improve. And initially it does sound, but uh, really over time, um, that improvement goes away pretty quickly. Um, and it's a, it's a reasonably big surgery. So um, typically we don't do that uh, nearly as much anymore, or very often at all. Um, and then ultimately, if a patient kind of fails all the conservative methods, fails uh, or isn't a candidate for Celesta or a sacral nerve stimulator, um, but they still have incontinence that keeps them homebound, essentially, um, a colostomy is always an option, which always sounds dramatic to everyone, including the patients. But, you know, I've had the patients that I've had that have ended up getting a colostomy because of just a, a refractory incontinence um, all say that their quality of life has dramatically improved with a colostomy. So it's, it's always an option. Um, so again, benefits of Celesta are that it's quick, it's not surgical, um, it doesn't require sedation or anesthetic, um, and the Celesta is the only FDA-approved injectable bulking agent uh, for patients with fecal incontinence or bowel incontinence. <clears throat> 
Um, it's done outpatient, uh, just in a clinic-based setting. There is no anesthetic required. And, and you know, a lot of the patients, again, are on the 65 plus scale. And so they're thinking appropriately, you know, what are the, the downstream consequences of having anesthesia from a surgical procedure? You know, will I have any sort of cognitive decline? And so being able to offer something that doesn't require anesthesia can be a real benefit. And that's what Celesta provides. Um, if patients have some benefit, typically what I'll do is if they have, uh, I'll inject um, with the, the four injection series. Um, and then if they have some benefit in the next four to eight weeks, um, I'll consider a repeat injection. And typically the patients that I'll repeat inject will be the ones that had some improvement, but aren't quite to their goal yet of quality of life. Um, the patients that have no improvement with the first injection, typically I tend to not uh, offer them a second injection just because I feel like it's less likely to make much of a difference. Um, or patients that have a great response to the first uh, injection series, then, you know, I just tell them to, to call me if they feel like their incontinence is worsening in the future and we can always do it again. Um, the other important thing to know is that Celesta doesn't preclude any other therapy. So um, all of these, again, kind of work in different ways. The fiber, the emodium, the Celesta, the sacral nerve stimulator, they can all be used in the same patient to try to achieve the best quality of life. And so I think that's also really helpful to remember is this, if it, if it doesn't work or if it works some or if it works for a while but then stops working, you know, they can always go on to get something else. Um, so a little bit more about Celesta gel. Um, so it is this uh, this natural, this non-animal stabilized hyaluronic acid carrier gel um, plus a dextron or microsphere. And so essentially my rudimentary understanding of it is that um, it provides this framework for your own body's ingrowth. And so um, you can see down here at the bottom, you, you have the initial injection and then there's a cartoon of collagen and fibroblasts um, growing into this. And so um, you know, patients are always a little bit concerned initially, you know, oh, well, is it always going to be there? Will it eventually go away? And the answer is it's always there. Um, it'll never go away. But one of the ways that I kind of describe it to folks is that um, it, it just basically adds a little bit of additional bulk, similar to the hemorrhoidal cushions that we're all born with, and that probably provides some degree of continence. It just adds a little bit of additional tissue within the anal canal that's now weakened because of, of you know, atrophy or muscle injury. Um, and so, so it's almost just filling just a little bit of space in a very kind of soft, uh, cushiony way. Um, the, the other good thing about Celesta is it's not a new thing. So it's been around for a while. It's safety and efficacy have been proven, um, in 2011, um, it was launched and, uh, you can see that multiple publications have, uh, have been uh, inclusive of Celesta, uh, again, from a safety standpoint, from a long-term durability standpoint. Um, and one of the reasons that maybe some of you haven't heard about it before recently is because it's changed hands multiple times. Um, and typically it's been with smaller companies. And so I think it's pretty exciting that Teleflex has bought um, or has acquired Celesta um, or merged with, however you want to say it, uh, because, because I think it it has been a long time coming that Celesta is more widely known and more widely used as um, a treatment in the fecal incontinence treatment pathway. Um, and again, from a from a data standpoint, again, it's been proven that um, that patients feel like it does improve their quality of life. Um, there's been uh, a, over about two time increase of incontinence free days. Um, so kind of said another way, um, you can see the 53% reduction in medium number of um, fecal incontinence episodes through three years. And that was the duration of the study, but likely it'll last longer than that. Um, you know, the reality is that over time, muscle atrophy will continue. And so it may lose efficacy over time, not because the celesta goes away, but because the muscles die or atrophy a little bit more. But that's, uh, again, another reason that it's a nice option because you could always potentially retreat with celesta, you know, three to five years later if, if muscle atrophy continues and if their symptoms recur. Um, and then uh, the the in one of the studies that showed that more than 80% of patients did not require additional intervention for up to three years. And so again, you know, for a patient that's 75, three years is a really big deal. Um, and then, you know, making some decisions uh, at that three-year mark if it recurs. 
Um, so again, um, it's safe and uh, over 8,000 procedures have been done with Celesta um, worldwide. Um, I did one today. Um, I've not had a patient have a complication from it. I know it's possible. Um, and I know that, you know, it's one of those things where you do enough and eventually you'll have a complication, but, um, but I find that patients tolerate it really well. Um, it, it's been proven that it has the potential to improve quality of life. Um, and again, I think the, the big benefit is that it's quick, it's painless, it can be done in your office without sedation. Um, it takes 15 minutes or less, um, and, and that's a big deal for patients. So this is a video uh, that, that depicts uh, kind of how Celesta, Celesta works as a bulking agent. So, and then you can see it uh, kind of um, filling the space a little bit. Um, again, just increasing these very soft um, areas so that now the, the lumen of the anal canal um, isn't narrowed, but it just has kind of more you know, pillows on the side almost. Um, if you do a digital rectal exam, immediately after doing Celesta, you'll feel a little bit. Um, if you do a digital rectal exam two years after doing Celesta, um, often, you know, I have to remind myself that they had the procedure done. Um, so it's administered, uh, again, in the office. And so if you have a, a table that um, turns into the project neck position, I prefer that, um, but definitely left lateral is reasonable. And then I've heard recently that um, it's been done in stirrups as well. And so a lot of it is what your practice setup is like and what you're comfortable with as a provider. Um, there are four one millimeter, milliliter uh, injections that are done through an anoscope. And so you know, for our clinic, because we do an anoscopy a lot in the colorectal clinic for lots of reasons, we have the reusable, um, the reprocessed anoscopes, but they make a lot of really nice um, disposable anoscopes these days as well. So that would not be a limiting factor for most practices. Um, it's injected five millimeters above the dentate line. So again, this is in, a, in an insensate area. And so it generally is not painful. I do always tell my patients beforehand, you know, if, if you hear it, feel anything more than pressure, please let me know. And then I would just reposition the needle a little bit higher. Um, but it's really uncommon that, that anyone says that. Um, and again, no anesthesia is required. So before the procedure, um, I tell the patient, you know, there's, I personally don't find uh, an enema to be helpful, although um, sometimes it's recommended. Um, for me, I would rather have solid stool um, within the anorectum because I feel like I can push that out of the way easier versus liquid stool that for me kind of gets in the way more. Um, but I, I know that's a kind of a provider preference. Uh, so before the procedure, I just tell them to show up. We talk about the risks and typically I'll tell them there's a small risk of bleeding, a small risk of infection. There's a risk that it's not going to fix their symptoms or get them the result that they're hoping for. Um, and um, and there's a risk of pain. Um, and then um, after the procedure, I typically have them wait uh, for about 10 minutes in the office just to make sure they don't have any vasovagal symptoms. And then, um, and then usually I will have them give me a, a, send me a message or give me a call about four to six weeks later to let me know how they're doing overall and if they want to schedule a second injection. Um, so, Patients who are candidates for treatment, um, I mean, all, most patients with incontinence could be a candidate for treatment, but I do think, and it's in some studies that it's been shown that patients with um, uh, less severe uh, incontinence, so if you're using the, score, the Cleveland Clinic scale, um, patients on the lower end of that scale, um, or patients who have episodes just less frequently. So a patient who has an episode, you know, once a week, once a month, once every couple months, those are probably very reasonable candidates for Lesta. Celesta. Patients that are having 10 incontinence episodes a day probably won't have a significant improvement in quality of life because if you take 10 and you, you know, even decrease the episodes by 50%, you're still having five episodes a day. And so that may not be as impactful. Um, so again, it's safe, it's effective, it's durable. Um, it has an a uh, measured improvement in quality of life, um, and uh, overall um, patients tolerate it really well. 
Um, so things that the company can help with, um, they can help with office-based material, and this is very helpful for patients when they're considering next steps in treatment. Typically, I'll have a conversation with the patient initially about things like fiber, Imodium, um, pelvic floor strengthening exercises, um, and then I'll give them information about Celesta and then have them try fiber and Imodium. And then if that doesn't work, they'll send me a message and we'll get them scheduled for uh, Celesta if that's what they're interested in. Um, there is a coding and billing support line, and uh, Celesta, the company, is really helpful at running a patient's insurance to help them understand what their copay might be. Um, anybody with Medicare um, in our office, um, it, it, Medicare covers it, so we don't even do a pre-authorization for Medicare patients, um, but sometimes having them understand what their copay is is really helpful for them. Um, and then for private insurances, it's also really helpful to have Celeste run that information because there are a few insurances we've run into in patients less than 65 that don't cover it as well. Uh, and so uh, with that, I'm going to stop with the slides and open it up to questions. Dr. Ford, hi. Thank you so much for that. I do have a couple of questions that have been in on the chat. And we wanted to ask you, um, what do you say about retreatment and follow-up to your patients after they've had their injection? Sure. So um, right now, and I'll, I'll be honest, one of the reasons that I kind of do more over messaging is because uh, we are in the process of training our new PA um, to, to help me with incontinence care. Um, we had a nurse practitioner and she um, moved to inpatient care. And so um, she and I had a really good routine down. And so they would usually follow up with her, but you know, it de just depends on what your system is. So typically I would have, her, have them either follow up or message me within four to six weeks after the procedure. And then again, if, if they had some improvement, but they're not to where they want to be, then we would schedule a second injection. And I think, I think the literature says you can do it at four weeks. For me, I found that the six to eight week mark is a little bit more helpful, but I don't think it makes a big difference. Um, some of it's just scheduling and timing. And then, um, and then it, again, if it didn't make any difference, then we kind of talk through what additional options there may be. So I have a question for you, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I have after the, um, after the patients have had injections, many of them say they feel like they are full or constipated. And you've emphasized very firmly in this to in this talk that they are not constipated, that they just feel that. Can you speak a little bit to that? Sure. Well, they may be constipated, just to clarify, but they're not constipated from the Celesta. So, so that, you know, it just has to be separated out. So they may develop some constipation from whatever, um, you know, or if they tend towards that, but it's not from the Celesta actually blocking the passage of stool. However, initially, and thank you for bringing this up because I didn't say this, initially I do say that um, for the first few days, especially, it will feel, because of these has added this bulk into the anal canal, it'll feel like you have to have a bowel movement, but it's not actually stool. It's just this added bulk and it's kind of learning what that sensation is. Um, and over time that gets better and goes back to pretty much normal. But for the first few days, it feels like you have to have a bowel movement. So if you feel like you have to go, sit down on the toilet, go through the motions, relax, let it come out. If nothing comes out, get up and go. Don't sit there and strain because that's just that sensation that's less as causing. So I wonder if it's more of a, a more of a sensation than an actual constipation. Yeah, I think we have to remember these patients have not had their nerves engaged in this area in a long time. And finally, you're bulking them and they're having to remember what that clenching feels like or it, where they're, they're not used to it. It's been a sort of not, those nerves have not been touching for so long. So, um, all right, we do also have another question just came in about a contraindication in the setting of a rectocele. And I will tell you that that is um, a contraindication use for rectocele. It's, it's not to be done with patients with rectocele. However, uh, the treatment was not effective. And is that, in your opinion, due to the the retained stool in rectocele or the lack of muscle? Or what would you, what is the reasoning around not doing a rectocele or not being as effective? Sure. Um, I, I mean, so some of it probably is just that, um, that the, especially the, in the anterior anal canal, when you have a rectocele, um, your anorectal, um, uh, 
like thickness, I guess, or, uh, you know, everything is so thinned out there um, because you're getting this kind of bulging into the vagina with uh, every bell salva every time you bear down. And so um, you get thinning of um, these layers. And so one, I think it would be a lot more likely that you would struggle to actually get an appropriate injection kind of target for the celesta. Um, but then also, again, um, you know, I think that I think not injecting into the the rectocele would be important. I mean, it's also not unreasonable because again, it's such a low risk procedure to try, you know, to try to adjust your sites. Uh, and I'm saying this from clinical practice, not from the the um, Celesta company, but to try to adjust your sites to where you're not injecting into the rectocele to see if that provided any improvement for the patients, um, kind of bulking the, the rest of the areas. Okay, thank you uh, very much. It was very helpful to have you here. Is there anything else that you would like to say in conclusion? Otherwise, I'll um, I'll leave us for the evening. No, I think um, I think it's a, a really good option for a lot of patients, and I think the biggest thing again is just kind of on us as providers to to help patients feel comfortable about bringing it up um, and help educate our colleagues that there are options for fecal incontinence um, and that you know that that there are some very reasonable low risk treatments that that have the potential to have some really big life impacts. Well, I want to I appreciate it very much. We appreciate your time and your sharing of your expertise. And um, we will be following up to those that are on this call with some contact. If you ever need anything, don't hesitate to reach out to me. We can set you up with Dr. Ford if she's available. And uh, we're always here to help you and your patients have the best um, care pathway possible. Y'all have a great evening.